Our Heavenly Father, you are holy, holy, holy. And Lord, when we gather to worship you, we know that you inhabit the praises of your people and we are indeed on holy ground because you are here. And Father, it's our desire today to worship you as we continue to study your word. And it's our desire, Father, that in worshiping you, that we would understand that worship is is more than just the words we say, but it's the life response that we give, Father, that you command us that we are to present ourselves to you as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing, acceptable to you. That, Father, is the type of worship that we seek today. So I pray, Lord, that if there is anyone here uh, who does not know where they stand with you, that today would be that day in which they come to saving faith in Christ. And Father, for the remainder who would say that, oh yes, I belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, I ask and pray that as we enter into this Christmas season, Father, that your Holy Spirit would renew within us that sense of awe and wonder, reverence and gratitude in our hearts that you might be the greatest object of our affection and the greatest love we have. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, it's good to see you this Thanksgiving weekend. I hope that you had a nice Thanksgiving. I'm aware that we have many who are traveling out this Thanksgiving, and they're coming back this weekend before school, and we also have many of you who perhaps are visiting um, someone else welcome this weekend. Did you have a nice Thanksgiving? Good. I'm trying to keep you engaged because I was told that many of you ate enough carbohydrates that you may well fall asleep at any given moment, so we don't want it to happen. No, don't raise your hand. Don't point at your mom. You can't do that. <laughs> oh, my. Well, just a couple of things I want you to know on the front end, and I've been meaning to say this. Um, before COVID, and a lot of you were not here before COVID. Before COVID, and, and with a sanctuary would be, be filled, and we would have a part of our worship, and people have asked several times, which is why I'm bringing it up, do you still, do, do, do you all take offerings or receive offerings? And it's like, yes, we do. But because of COVID, the plate was, we weren't, people weren't comfortable with the plate being passed around. Does that make sense? And so they didn't want to touch what people touch, touch, touch. Yes, so we still do give. And the ways that you give are online, and we also have giving boxes by either door. So when we give, we don't give to earn God's favor. We don't give out of, uh, oh, I have to, but it's a joyful act of, of worship. And we will talk We'll have a, a message, a biblical message on what giving is and is not in January to clarify that. But so you'll know, yes, we still do. We just don't pass the plates. And uh, um, and with the, the new <laughs> variant or whatever is going around, we may not pass the plates for a while. We'll see. But the main thing is our God is in control, and we are now entering into our Christmas sermon series. This is absolutely my favorite time of year because there is that sense in which for many people, there's a time in which people slow down and they think and they remember and you recapture that sense of beauty and wonder. And that's my prayer for you. So I'm going to start you off by asking you a question. As a matter of fact, I'm going to have to ask you a lot of questions today to keep you engaged. And just to give you a heads up, you might want to take some notes today. How many of you have read C.S. Lewis's wonderful book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? If you haven't, you need to. And I'm not just talking to kids, I'm talking to adults. I saw an amazing testimony of a woman who's an atheist. And she grew up an atheist, rather, in in an atheistic household. And uh, yet, her family loved C.S. Lewis, and they loved his work, or his fiction works, rather, because he wrote well. And uh, so she had read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe several times. And she enjoyed it, but she never connected the dots that Aslan is the Christ figure that the white witch is the Satan figure. She didn't understand all of that. One day, as she is, and I believe in her late 30s or early 40s, her life bottoms out. She just hits rock bottom. And so for the first time, she decides she's going to just grab a Bible. She starts reading the gospel. The gospel, I forget which gospel it was, but she starts reading the gospel. And as she gets to to the part of the gospels where Jesus lets himself I mean, he, he doesn't, doesn't resist being captured and beaten and willingly lay his life down. And as he is lifted up on that cross, she cried out. She literally found herself saying out loud while she cried, no, Aslan, no, 
and the Holy Spirit took all of that that she had read before when she read the Bible to connect the beautiful story of the gospel she comes to saving faith. I want to encourage you, you need to read the book. It's a wonderful book. But in that book, most of the story takes place in this mythical land called Narnia. Uh, it's a land that's under a curse, specifically under the curse of the white witch. And one way that Narnia is described is very interesting. In Narnia, it's always winter and never Christmas. Always winter, never Christmas. Only Aslan, again, who is the Christ figure, has the power to stop the witch and to undo the curse. Always winter and never Christmas is a very powerful and poetic way of describing what it's like to live in a fallen and broken world that is cursed by sin, in a world where people are longing for hope, longing for redemption. Always winter, never Christmas. How long, O oh Lord? Waiting. Wondering. The past two years have been difficult for many people, um, not just in our country, but around the world. And what we have found is, as, a, as you look at the research, is that uh, many, <laughs> many people have expressed that they have felt during these past few years a terrible sense of isolation, loneliness, uh, depression has been very high. Uh, it has risen rather to a high level during this time period. But it's not just COVID. It's been the lockdowns. It's been the confusing messages, the social and spiritual tensions, the cultural anger. You put these things together, and it's the realization also that technology and politicians and science and the media can't solve all of our problems. In fact, at times it seems they feed them. It's that plus economic uncertainty, seismic cultural shifts, not knowing where all of this is going. And just when you think you round a corner, another bit of is it news or not news drops. And so people are weary. They're anxious. And again, many are depressed and looking for hope. In other words, many in our culture today have an idea of the meaning of always winter and never Christmas, wondering if Christmas, meaning hope, will come. When will there be good news? And what we are experiencing in our world today, just in these past two years, is a very small taste, a very small taste of what the people of God experienced as they waited on Messiah. It's a very tiny taste. Their wait was not a couple of years, but for thousands of years. You see, God's people had heard the promises. They knew the promises. Promises were given from the moment our first parents rebelled in the garden and sin entered into the human condition and affected everything negatively. God promised in the garden in Genesis 3.15, and you can write this down and look these cross-references up for yourself. This is not our text. That he would send one who would be this, from the seed of a woman, which is remarkable language. It's the only place in all of Scripture where someone is referred to as coming from the seed of a woman. The seed always comes from the man. Meaning there's going to be someone, something very unusual about one who would come. And this is referring to the virgin birth. That the one who would come would crush the head of Satan. That's the very first reference to the gospel, to Jesus in the Bible. So from the very beginning, God gives promises. There were many more promises over the centuries. Generations came and went. People lived and died. And they waited. And they didn't see the fulfillment of those promises. Then you have Abraham, the father of our faith. And he was promised that through him, through his line, all nations, all peoples would be blessed. And God's people waited on that promise. And they waited, and they waited, and they experienced hardships such as 400 years of slavery in Egypt. How long, oh Lord, how long? Always winter, never Christmas. They waited. Much later, the Lord gave them a great king, King David, and a promise was given that through his line, the line of David, Messiah would come, and the people rejoiced, and they hoped, and they waited. 
Later, the kingdom was divided. And later still, God's people were conquered by the Babylonians. The city of Jerusalem was burned down to the ground. People were slaughtered in mass. It was horrific. Those who surrendered early, those who they deemed worthy, they kept and hauled off into exile, and a few remaining people were left to fend for themselves. The pattern that you see with God's people throughout what we would call the Old Testament, and we can certainly relate to this. We see this in the New Testament. We see this in our own lives. Often in the waiting, the people grew weary of waiting. They grew impatient, and they would find themselves falling into sin. They would find themselves rebelling. They would find themselves thinking, well, you know, we'll just do it. We'll, we'll take things in our matters into our own hands. And then God would discipline them to get their attention. He would send them more prophets, more promises. The people would return, and this cycle would repeat over and over and over. Later, the Jews were allowed to return to Jerusalem, but the troubles didn't stop there because even as they're rebuilding the city and the nation, and while they're waiting, more promises are given, and they think about all the promises going back to the garden, going back to Abraham, back to David. All that stuff seemed to be so long ago, and by the time we get to Christ's birth, Israel is occupied by the mightiest army and the mightiest empire in the history of humanity, Rome. So you can imagine the people at that time looking back on all of these promises and then looking at Rome and their current situation. It's always winter and never Christmas. Hope doesn't come. How long, God? And some of you are there. Some of you are there right now, you're wondering, God, how long? Because you're weary, you're tired, you want hope. You're wondering where God is and what he's doing. The challenge for us is, is that we tend to think that God operates on our, ta- our timetable. Can we agree on that? That's a real dangerous thing. God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. God sees the end from the beginning. He is all wise. He is sovereign. He knows everything that we don't know. We know this. (laughs) And we focus on this. Write this down. You can look it up on your own. But in Galatians 4, 4 and 5, we're told that in the fullness of time, God sends his son fullness of time, meaning in God's own sovereign wisdom, he knew the precise time and moment in history that this promise would need to be fulfilled. Today we begin our Christmas sermon series, and we're starting off in the gospel of Matthew. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 1 or your Bible app, and if you don't have either, the text will be on the screen. The goal of this series is that once more, I pray that as we walk through our Christmas sermon series each week, that we would be in awe of Christ, that the Holy Spirit would do a work in our lives to recapture that sense of awe and wonder, and that we would be mindful of the precious hope that we have through Jesus Christ our Lord, that we would not be given into despair nor fear nor anxiety, but that we would worship the King. God has given us the greatest gift imaginable, Jesus Christ. But for a gift to be a gift that is truly appreciated, you must appropriate that gift. You must receive that gift. He offers Jesus freely. Salvation is a free gift. You'll never be able to earn it nor work for it. But you and I must respond to Christ good news is, is that because of Jesus Christ, the curse is undone, is being undone. Evil does not win. Jesus will make all things new. That is glorious. Now, we start in Matthew 1, 1 through 17, and if you've already turned there, some of you are saying, wait a minute, man. You told me that you were sensitive to the fact that I was sleepy, and I see a whole bunch of names. (laughs) Hang in there. Okay? Okay? We're going to read all 17 verses, 
And I know on the front end what a lot of you are going to say. So just hang in there. And some of you have already jumped to the conclusion, how do I quickly slip out? Don't. You're going to see beautiful things in here because God put them there. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. And Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, Tamar, and Perez, the father of Hezron, and Hezron, the father of Ram, and Ram, the father of Amminadab, and Amminadab, the father of Nashon, and Nashon, the father of Salmon, and Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of David the king. But wait, there's more. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam the father of Abijah, and Abijah the father of Asaph, and Asaph the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat the father of Joram, and Joram the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah the father of Jotham, and Jotham the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh the father of Amos. And Amos, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jehoianiah, and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. After the, deport, after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel, and Shealtiel, the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel, the father of Abiud, and Abiud, the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim, the father of Azor, and Azor, the father of Zadok, and Zadok, the father of Achim, and Achim, the father of Eliud, and Eliud, the father of Eliezer, and Eliezer, the father of Methan, and Methan, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. Now, a lot of you are saying this, seriously, I came for a genealogy thing, and he's going to break down every name, and we will be here through. No, I'm not. You need to stay awake, and you need to hang in here. You see, the great danger is this, and I'm being very serious. Oftentimes, when we are reading the scriptures, and we run across something like this, we look at it, and we go, eh, and we go to, we go to the next chapter. That is a huge mistake. The Holy Spirit Put these words here for a reason. Put these names here for a reason. We are to know this for a reason. First, we need to ask why the Spirit of God inspires Matthew to write these names down and also the particular way he writes them down. This is very helpful. There actually are many reasons as to the why. But please know this, to Matthew's first Jewish audience who would have heard this gospel or read it. While you and I sat there and thought, oh, my soul, I, these names, I recognize some of them. A lot of them I don't. I don't get the point. To those who first heard, the Jewish audience who first heard and first read, they were blown away because they saw things in our Western 21st century mindset we don't see. They heard things that you and I do not hear. And my prayer today is that we will all leave here saying, oh, I get that now. The opening words first would have grabbed their attention profoundly. Literally, the opening words are read as follows. The book of Genesis of Jesus Christ, son of David, son of God. Sinclair Ferguson points this out. The word choice is not accidental. Matthew's book is the story of a new genesis, a new beginning. His gospel, and indeed the Christian gospel message as a whole, is about God establishing his kingdom and beginning what the Apostle Paul would call in 2 Corinthians 5.17, a new creation. Matthew's gospel is all about Jesus Christ, the son of David, and God's kingdom restoring life to what it was meant to be. In other words, it's about a new Genesis. They would have heard this opening line and immediately perked up. In Matthew's gospel, God is bringing about a great reversal of the curse. 
The curse is being undone. Everything in the Old Testament that was prior to this was preparing God's people for this specific moment in time. And Matthew was announcing, now the time has come. Winter is over. The curse is undone. Matthew's opening words are tremendous news for anybody who longs and waits for a new beginning, a new start. And again, that's where some of you may well be. You long for a new beginning. You long for a new start. I have good news for you. Jesus Christ is all about forgiving and giving new life and new starts. He's all about healing that which is broken, restoring that which needs to be restored. Do you know this Jesus? And if you do, do you truly believe he is who he claimed to be? That he can truly do what he claimed that he would be able to do? Now, what about this list of names? What do we do with these names? First of all, three things we need to note when it comes to how Matthew refers to Jesus. These are also really important things. Matthew's audience would have understood, so we need to. First, Jesus is the Christ. We see this in verse 1, verse 16, 17, and 18. Verse 1, 16, 17, and 18. Christ is the Greek equivalent of Messiah, meaning the anointed king that God promised who would deliver his people from their bondage. So Jesus is Messiah. Jesus is the promised one right out of the gate. And then repeated several times. Second, verse 1, Jesus is also the son of Abraham. God had promised again that through his seed one would come who would undo the curse, who would bless all nations. Matthew is saying this is the one that was promised. This is the one, the fulfillment of that promise. Third, verse 1, Jesus is also the son of David. This is a huge thing in this genealogy. God promised again that a descendant from David would rule over a kingdom that would never end, that would stretch from one end of the earth to the other. And Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. He reigns over all people, over all history, over all time. And he came to redeem people from every nation, tribe, and tongue. Matthew is telling his readers that Jesus is the Christ, the son of Abraham, the son of David. He is the king. He's the one we've waited for. Winter is over. The king has come. What about their other names? You look at that and you go, there are a lot of other names. There are. Matthew crams about 2,000 years of Bible history into 16 verses. That's why you're like, when you hear this, you're going, wow. 42 generations are listed. But he also has sorted these names into, you'll have noted, three groups. There are three distinct groups and you need to notice this because I want you to know how to study the Bible. So when you read through, if you, were, if you were to have skipped this, you wouldn't have noticed it. But if you were reading this text carefully, you would say, wait a minute, there seems to be three sections here. And there are. There are three sections. Three groups of 14 generations each. We have from Abraham to David, from David to the Babylonian exile, and from the exile to the birth of Christ. The question is, why does the Holy Spirit lead Matthew to organize things this way? What's interesting is if you compare Matthew's gospel to Luke, Luke goes the opposite direction, and he includes names and omits names that are not in Matthew's genealogy. What's interesting to note is that we know from other parts of the Bible that there were more than 42 generations between Abraham and Jesus. So the question is, why did Matthew abbreviate them? Why did he do that? Why three groups of 14? Why does the Holy Spirit want that to be known? It is a very deliberate pattern. Now, some of you are saying, wait a minute, what do you mean he skips generations? Because, I, you know, maybe you went to whatever, uh, what's the thing uh, where you get your, you, you find out your family tree? What's the thing called? The swab? Ancestry, with geon, all that stuff, right? So you, you did that and you say, wait a minute, you don't skip generations. You're thinking like a 21st century Westerner. They did not see Oh, we're being dishonest. There were many different ways that they would do genealogies when you see them in Scripture. Some of the genealogies, they were listed for legal and political reasons, so there might be an omission of names because they're trying to highlight these are the important people you need to know. 
The same is here in Jesus. For redemptive purposes, it's not that every single person throughout the family tree was mentioned. There will be times in which there will be things skipped. But they, these are the important people that the Holy Spirit wants us to know are a part of that line. Commentators all note that Matthew's genealogy is abbreviated, but they not all explain why. Dr. Raymond Dillard, in his commentary on the book of Chronicles, interestingly enough, gives a lot of details on, and Hebrew genealogies are very intricate. They're very, they're very interesting. And he refers, actually, to Matthew's genealogy. He wrote this, The most common type of fluidity in biblical genealogies is referred to as telescoping, which is the omission of names from the list. Unimportant names are left out in order to relate an individual to a prominent ancestor. So, in other words, if dad was not as prominent and you're going to jump from granddad to son to, to the son or whatever. It's the idea of keeping the, the prominent names to the front. Or to achieve a particular number of names in a genealogy, often to achieve multiples of seven, which represent perfection or God. And we see this in Matthew's genealogy. In Matthew chapter 1, the number 14 is also significant because that number refers to someone very special as well. All that to say there is a reason the genealogy is designed the way it is, organized the way that it is. If we go back to Ferguson, he explains what Dillard referred to. To Matthew's Jewish audience, the number 14, and we see 14 three times in this passage, right? 14 is a big deal. Had very special significance because it was King David's number in the Hebrew Dalit, Bav, Dalit. Three consonants, that's how you would spell David. They didn't have vowel points. In Hebrew Gematria, the number is 14. David's number is 14. And you might be going, okay, good gosh, where is this going and why is this important? Ferguson is telling us that to that first Jewish audience, as they would read or hear this genealogy, they would have heard something shouted in the background, and that would be this, David, David, David. And that is to say, again, the promised one is here. He's here. In verse 1, he wants us to know that Christ is the son of David. The whole genealogy focuses on Jesus' royal identity as the son of David. The message is clear that Jesus, the king, is the legal heir to the throne of David. Throughout uh, Israel's history, there were many, many times, no doubt, that God's people were wondering how long and when is it going to happen. And Matthew's opening line says, the wait is over. But there's also something very unusual in Matthew's genealogy that you don't see typically in Hebrew genealogies, and you're going to, if you were paying attention, you will have noted women are in this genealogy. That's very unusual. And it's not just one woman, but there are five. You see, in these Hebrew genealogies, they will always trace the line through the man. So you heard this a lot. So-and-so, the father of so-and-so, the father of so-and-so, right? You heard that a lot. But then you had these five women. Now, why are they there? What's so amazing about these women? Why is this, why, why are they, why, why are there, what is their significance? Now, the first four women have some things in common. Write this down. I want you to know their stories. In verse 3, he refers to Tamar. Verse 5, Rahab. Verse 5, Ruth. Verse 4, no, excuse me, verse 6, the wife of Uriah the Hittite, you may know as Bathsheba. What's significant about these ladies? First, these four, they're non-Israelites. They don't belong, quote unquote. They don't fit here. Not in a proper Hebrew genealogy. Second, they all had question marks over their lives. In their lives, you see pain, shame, being an outsider in their stories. And again, write this down if you want to explore more. I encourage you to do so. Tamar gave birth to the twin sons of her father-in-law, Judah. And that's a tragic and sad story in Genesis chapter 38. 
Rahab was a prostitute. Read about her in Joshua 2, 1 and following. Ruth was a Moabite. The Moabites and all of their descendants were actually permanently banned from the congregation of Israel. Yet she is in this list. Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite, was the object of David, King David's adultery. Luke doesn't mention these women in his genealogy. So we have to ask, why did the Holy Spirit lead Matthew to put these women here? Commentators said some amazing, I think some very practical and amazing things about why these women are in this genealogy. One, God's grace is for more than just the Jews. These four, first four were not Jewish women. But well, praise God that Jesus Christ did not just come for those who were ethnic Israel. He came to save people from every nation, tribe, and tongue. He came for people like you and me. Now wait, did you catch that? Or are you already asleep? Jesus came for all people and people like you and me. Not, you didn't have to have a religious resume that says, oh yes, I am Jewish to be saved. He came for Jew and Gentile alike so that all of us might have the opportunity to be in relationship with our creator, to have our sins forgiven. Second, he is saying that God is the one who overcomes, redeems, heals the effects of sin and shame as he works out his purposes. And some of you may be dealing with shame and guilt and pain. Know this, our God is still in the business of redeeming broken things. Three, we mentioned these women are outsiders, and this is important because Matthew, what was his story? What was his occupation before the Lord Jesus says, you follow me, a tax collector? He was considered a traitor and unclean. He was the quintessential outsider of his day. And yet Jesus chose him. And when you walk through Matthew's gospel, you see that Matthew also mentions the visit of the wise men from the east. He's the only one who does that. He mentions these outsiders from the east who come to visit and worship Jesus and give him gifts when he is born. In fact, as you walk through Matthew's gospel, you will see that there are several, quote, outsider stories in Matthew's gospel. And Matthew's gospel ends with Jesus telling his disciples to go take the gospel to all the outsiders, to all the peoples from all ethnic groups, to all nations. Oh, Matthew understood what it was like to be an outsider, and some of you do as well, and you've bought into a lie that you have to have a really good religious resume to be accepted by God. No, you do not. You come to him just as you are because he paid for everything. Four, these women's names also tell us this. Jesus was not born into a family that had an impeccable past, a dazzling religious resume. He entered this broken and lost world into a family of no account that had a family tree that at times had people who, yeah, those are glorious, famous people. But then you say, well, yeah, Abraham, that was amazing. But yeah, Abraham messed up in some big ways sometimes. Oh, there's David. He's amazing. But eh, except for the times David wasn't amazing and he did some pretty bad things. And then you look at the others here. I love what another commentator wrote. And I thought you can't say it better. Jesus came to save the kind of people we see in his family tree, people like you and me. That family tree is not pretty. It's not perfect. You ever run into people where they tell you their family tree and it's like, wow, seems to me you come from royalty going back to the first century. That's really amazing. My family tree is kind of naughty. <laughs> Got all kinds of messes on it. Goes sideways. I'm thankful that my heritage is not that which determines my ability to be saved. These women's names also tell us that God uses the most unlikely of people for his purposes. Believe me this, Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba, these first four women, they were not able to see during their time. You know what? God's going to use all of this stuff that I'm going through for his ultimate redemptive purposes. They didn't know that. 
Just like you don't know how God is going to work in and through you and what he's doing in your life right now. And the, how it fits into the larger scheme of things. you got to trust him. Nor could the fifth woman who's mentioned in this genealogy, she didn't know the totality of all that was taking place. She knew a lot, but she didn't know everything. It's a young virgin named Mary. A young girl from a humble background. She's a devout woman of God, but she was not viewed as important by worldly standards. She was no one of consequence. But God chose her for this amazing assignment to be the mother of Jesus. She has no idea. She, she hears enough when she is told what's happening, and to her credit, let it be, may it be so. She is a woman of faith. But she did not say, oh, wow, you know what? That means that I am the one referred to in Genesis 3.15, that from my seed, the seed of a woman, she didn't understand all of that. And we see throughout the Gospels, there were times that she seemed quite confused as far as what Jesus was doing, her son was doing. She didn't understand everything. These women tell us that God chooses the unlikely to accomplish his purposes. So I got great news for you. If you're sitting here looking at yourself saying, you know what? I'm nobody and I don't, I, I don't know. God can't use me. You're exactly the kind of person that God's going to use. God uses the weak and the broken and the humble. He doesn't use the proud and the arrogant. He doesn't use the self-satisfied. He doesn't use the ones that, that say, look at my religious resume and give me my due. He looks at the ones who simply say, Lord, I'm coming to you in fear and trembling, and here I am, and use me, and I know I can't do it, and that's the ones that he used. The ones so you come to him again as you are, and you trust him. But there's one more thing that we need to look at in this genealogy. I told you we weren't going to look at every name, and some of you I know were scared of. We were. We would have been here until four, if not later. Look in verse 16. Something very profound and very interesting happens here. Do you notice that jo uh, Joseph, we've been going through so-and-so, the father of so-and-so, the father of so-and-so, the father of so-and-so, right? Joseph is not listed as the father of Jesus. How is he listed? As the husband of Mary. Oh, that's huge. That's huge. Do you see what you miss when you just look at the genealogist and go, eh, give me something more interesting. You might say, well, wait a minute, some of you may not be getting it. Jesus did not have an earthly father. He was not the product of a union between uh, a man and a woman. This is a supernatural birth. This points to the virgin birth. Jesus is no ordinary child. This is God the Son who is in Mary's womb. This is Messiah, the one who has come to save us. Matthew's genealogy says to us, don't you see? God keeps his promises. He knows what he's doing. He doesn't forget us. In his own time, in the fullness of time, using the most unlikely of people, he has sent the promised one who is able to rescue us from our sin, shame, and our guilt. Good news is here. Winter is over. Christmas has come. Rejoice. That's what's being said in his gospel. Oh, you may be going through a difficult time right now, and you may be looking for hope. You may be stuck wondering in where God is. You may be stuck in your sin, wondering if God could ever forgive you. I challenge you this day, this day, to lift up your eyes to your king who is in the business of forgiving and saving, and he is in the business of restoring if you have strayed. He is in the business of reigniting the passion in your heart for him, your desire to walk with him. He is in the business of making broken things beautiful. He turns mourning into dancing, but you must come to him. And my prayer this Christmas season is, again, that we would have that sense of awe and of wonder that our God loves us and that he is amazing and that he is in control. These are the gifts that he has given through Jesus Christ, salvation, forgiveness, restoration. But you must come to him and you must receive that which he offers. So how do you need to respond to Christ today? We're going to pray and we're going to have a time of invitation. We'll stand and sing at that time. I will be here in the front. We'll have a counselor on either side. 
Perhaps, and I need to address those of you who may be watching by live stream, if you have questions about how to come to faith in Christ or what it means to follow Jesus or to receive that free gift of salvation, if you have questions about baptism, if you have questions about joining with our church, or if you just want to talk more about understanding the faith, please send an email to us at info at stonebridgesa.com. We'll set up a time to meet. For those of you who are here, if you need to know, if you need to nail this down, where you stand with Christ. If you have questions about baptism, and by the way, next week, and John will announce this again to reinforce, next Saturday after service briefly and next Sunday after service briefly, we're going to have a baptismal class for 20 minutes where we're going to talk about what is baptism, why is it a big deal. Please stick around for that. If you have questions about that, or if you have questions about joining the church, or if you just need someone to pray with you, please come forward. I pray, and we'll pray, we'll talk, we'll set times to meet. The biggest thing is for each of us to respond to the Lord Jesus as we need to. So how do you need to today? Father, I thank you for the precious gift of your son. And Lord, without the Lord Jesus Christ, we would all be lost and dead in our sins. Father, there are a lot of us here today who've gone through a, a lot of difficulties the past couple of years. But Father, you were over everything. And we can run to you. We can find our peace and our shelter and our hope in you. We can find healing in you and restoration in you. Father, there are some who are here today who perhaps are still have not yet trusted in you. And I ask and pray that today would be the day that that free gift of salvation is received. And yet others, fathers, need to follow through in their profession of faith by being baptized. Father, I pray that each one of us today would respond to you as we need to. Holy Spirit, ignite within us a fresh passion for the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that you'd help us to respond now, and I pray this in Jesus' name.